from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and in this podcast... We are going to be veering off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Special thanks to some of my patrons, of course. Elena, Aaron, Katoras, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Janice, Hammer, Katerina, Florence, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, two Emmas, Emily, Gabrielle, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, John, and my girl Judy. Thank you so, so much. I truly appreciate you. This is a patron requested episode, so we're going to be discussing the Goler clan. So let's begin. The Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia, Canada is an established wealthy farming community dating back to the very early 1800s. But above that valley, in the hills or mountains known as South Mountain, lives a far less fortunate group of people. You see, the soil there was not as good and suitable for growing a great many kinds of crops. So these people traditionally worked to make barrels for the apple orchards in the valley, or they worked as laborers for the orchards. And then as the years went on, they began to be replaced by machines or other modern technology. And as these things go, unfortunately, the families up in the hills were left with no job, no paycheck, and many were bound by poverty. And so... With this poverty and little to no opportunity, many didn't get much of an education either, and that meant many weren't able to read or write above a lower elementary level. This combination, of course, led to the inevitable bullying, so it didn't take long for the people who lived above that valley to begin to just keep to themselves, which is understandable. They did the very best they could, and what vegetables they could grow were things like potatoes or turnips, but not even enough to really turn any kind of a profit. And so they fished and hunted to be able to have meat to supplement their food. For generations, this is how these people survived. This held especially true for the Goler family. This family, in particular, became so isolated and withdrawn that even when the occasional outsider attempted to get to know them, they were met with verbal and, on occasion, physical assault. So, who are the Goalers? To be honest, I don't even know where to begin or exactly how to tackle this. So I'll start as far back as I could find, and even then, the records are difficult to get organized because there are quite a few reliable and upstanding sources that give some of these people different middle names or some of the women different last names and so on. Also, birth records could be off a year or two, so I put together what I could find the best I could. So... The furthest back I could find, the original Goler to the land in Nova Scotia was Silas Monday Goler. Now, it was said that Silas was either a Native American or possibly a captured man from Asia brought into slavery in Virginia and, as the tradition went, he used his slave owner's last name of Monday. Amelia was his African bride who was said to have been brought to the United States from Syria, which was then a trading post for African slaves from Nigeria or possibly Egypt, so she could have been from either of those places. So during the War of 1812, Silas and Amelia, who was pregnant and had already given birth to another of their children, escaped 
to Nova Scotia. Once they landed, they changed their last name from Monday to Goler so that they could hide where they were from. So in total, they had eight children, William, Emmeline, Harvey, Elizabeth, Frannick, James, Amy, and Josiah. Two were born in the U.S. and North Carolina, as far as I could find, and the rest in Nova Scotia. Silas was recorded as a, quote, black slave from the U.S., and he worked the apple orchards. And side note, if you can hear the cicadas outside, I apologize. I live in the country. They're quite loud. So it was then stated that this family began to have children with all different races, including Caucasian people. Now, all of those children went on to get married and have children of their own. To try to save on confusion and really my own mental state, we will stick with the family line that pertains to this story. So Silas and Amelia's son that was born on the ship on their way to Nova Scotia, William, went on to marry a woman named Maria Best. Together, they had seven children. The one that we will be following down the line was their son, James Thomas, who went by Thomas, born in 1840. And now here's where things get a little complicated. He had three wives slash common law wives, which I assume were at separate times. The first was Louisa Reed, who had been with a man named Oscar Kelly previously, and they had had one child prior to Louisa getting with Thomas. Oscar died at sea. Thomas and Louisa were never married, apparently, but they had four children together. Then Thomas abandoned her for the late Oscar's sister, Rachel. But don't worry, Louisa was fine. She went on and met someone else and then just kept having children. Thomas did actually marry Rachel in 1886. Now, I couldn't find whether or not they had had any children together, but she did die two years after the marriage, perhaps in childbirth, but I don't know. Thomas then married Lalia in 1890, and they also didn't have any children that I could find. But that is immaterial, because the next generation comes from the four children that Thomas had with Louisa, his first common-law wife. So Thomas Henry, or Hen Goler, was born in February 1877 in Kings County, Nova Scotia. His birth records do say that he was an illegitimate child, which matches with what we know about his parents never being married. He grew up to marry Mary Agnes, or Mamie, Welsh in 1906. This union would produce eight surviving children, though some were born prior to the marriage. Charles, born in 1905. Catherine, who also went by Kathleen in 1908. William, born in 1909. Florence in 1911. Cranswick in 1914. Mary Elizabeth the next year. Leota in 1919. And Madeline, who also went by Mildred, in 1920. They did have other children actually and their infants that died were a baby in 1907 who died during childbirth, baby Henry Thomas who died when he was four months old in 1920, and baby Josephine Lydia who died 28 days after birth in 1824. So I said all of that to say this. The eldest son, Charles, is the line we are going to follow now, the patriarch of our main story. He married a woman named Stella Welsh, who has the exact same last name as his mother's maiden name, Welsh. As far as I could make out, Stella and Charles's mother were at least cousins. This means Charles married his second cousin, allegedly. Also, Charles's sister, Mary Elizabeth, also married James Welsh, so that related her to her grandmother and her sister-in-law. So Charles worked for Canada Packers as well as working on a local farm, that is, when he could get work. Stella was most definitely the matriarch of this family and by all sources was basically the boss. Together, Charles and Stella had nine children. Marjorie Stella Jr., I'm going to call her Stella Jr., 
Mary, Josephine, Charles Jr., William, Thomas, Cranswick II, Cecil, who was born and remained nonverbal and paralyzed from the neck down and had to be cared for in a wheelchair. So, if I did my math correctly, this group of kids makes the fifth generation of goalers that had lived in Nova Scotia. And also at this point, I'm betting you've probably picked up on the theme of this family. Poverty and incest. They lived in utter poverty, actually, in two very basic rundown shacks, very remotely and removed from society on the property they had occupied for so long on that south-facing side of South Mountain. They were isolated from their local community and farmers, albeit purposefully, and they very much preferred it that way. Nearly all of them had very little education. They also rarely ever worked or were able to, except occasionally to help out local farmers, and therefore they survived mainly on welfare. Now, Charles and Stella's house that Charles had built had no running water, no bath, no toilet. Their children's education really never went past the third or fourth grade, so they were nearly all completely illiterate. These children also all slept on a shared mattress on the floor. So when I say poverty, I mean abject poverty. As the family continued to grow, as Charles and Stella's children began to have children of their own, all they could manage was to build sort of an enclosed, crude lean-to on the side of their tar paper shacks. And don't be fooled. Okay, it's stated that the neighboring communities and towns were well aware of the Golers, how they lived, how poor they were, and the few children who were able to attend school were horrifically bullied. To be called a Goler was a huge insult to anyone. So again, Charles and Stella's children indeed grew up to marry and have kids of their own. This is going to get complicated again, so try to stick with me. Mary Guller married a man named Roy Hiltz, and they had two children. Mary and Roy then got divorced, and Roy went on to marry Mary's sister, Stella Jr., if you will. At some point, Stella Jr., I believe, married a man named Eugene Brown. Mary and Stella Jr.'s brother, William, married a woman named Hazel Finch. Hazel's brother married Mary and Stella Jr.'s sister, Marjorie Goler, and Hazel's father married Josephine Goler. And the other siblings were married to other people, and are you with me so far? It is a lot, I know. William Goler, while being allegedly married to Hazel, had a common-law wife named Wanda Winston. And all of these people were having children with each other. It's less important to remember the names and just take away the fact that they were all sleeping together. In total, Charles the Patriarch and Stella the Matriarch had 14 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren between their nine children, though a couple of them never had any children like poor Cecil, who was bound to his wheelchair. So all of that backstory for this. Starting around 1980, several of the children began trying to tell outsiders about abuse that they were suffering, enduring at the hands of all of the grown-ups, parents, aunts and uncles, cousins, and so on, but people either didn't believe them or didn't bother, and when the Goler grown-ups found out that the children were squealing, well, they would be severely punished. So in 1984, one of the children, a 14-year-old girl, finally got up the courage to speak to one of her teachers, her being one of the rare Goler family members to continue on through school. She said that she desperately wanted to run away from her family and she flat out refused to go home. She said that her father, though I'm not sure which man was her father, was treating her like a wife having intercourse with her up to 15 times a month and telling her that she was going to carry his children. 
Horrified, of course, the teacher and the school contacted the authorities who came and took all of the children away and questioned them. And then the family's dirty little secrets came exploding out. Investigators determined after observation of the children and a battery of tests, the latest generations of the Goler clan inherited a century's worth of compromised genetics. Evidence indeed showed that the inbreeding went back approximately 100 years. There actually exists manuscripts dating back to 1860 showing inter-family relations were rampant. Needless to say, it didn't take long at all after the abuse came to public knowledge for the Gullers to be referred to as a, quote, hillbilly sex ring. And really, that's not much of a stretch now, is it? As it turned out, Charles, the patriarch of the family and grandfather to the seized children, would let people have sex with whichever of his own children that they wanted when they were little in exchange for some material goods, such as cigarettes or beer. But it was Stella Goler, the matriarch and grandmother, who really ran the show. And being raised in that environment, the Golers saw absolutely no issue with intermarrying with their own family members. Again, this had gone on for over 100 years. One source said 120 years. It's simply a case of the abused grew up to be abusers. They existed somewhere between a sex trafficking ring and a tight-knit cult that managed to conduct these horrible practices for generations. They would have one another's babies quite proudly, even the children. Now, remember we talked about babies or infants that died? Children who died at or shortly after childbirth were buried on the mountain and the number of unreported infant deaths could mean that many more were buried up there too. Some of the newest generation were born deaf and had terrible, terrible disabilities. And so, the Golers were rounded up and taken to jail. What did the RCMP do to this family? He broke my family all to pieces. Them caught it. They knew mine. He come here and got them boys. They were described as being completely unable to understand what was happening to them in the court system. If one were to, to make a blanket statement, one would have to say yes. They were uh, they were just totally on another planet, totally, uh, totally uh, unable to have the slightest idea in the world what was happening to them in the court process. They could define it in terms of uh, they're charged with something, um, but in terms of being able to appreciate any of the... The more basic things of what was happening to them, uh, I'd have to say that their level of appreciation was, was very, very low indeed. The children ages 6 through 14 were taken away permanently and put into foster care, and the parents were told they could no longer have any relationship with them. The ones under 6 years old were thankfully adopted. But allegedly, the adults knew at least on some level that what they were doing was wrong because they'd ask one child to act as a lookout while the adult assaulted another child. It was also stated that the children were threatened and beaten to keep them silent. Also, the children would be offered gifts to stay silent as well. So lawyers ordered IQ testing for each of the defendants and keep in mind this is the mid 80s the results of which indicated that they were all mildly to fairly severely mentally disabled. Quote, operating in the bottom one to two percent of the overall population, end quote. Again, it was brought up that they got between a second to fourth grade education and most of them were not really able to read or write at all or with any proficiency. And it was stated that they showed no remorse and they would not benefit from psychological treatment because they couldn't or wouldn't admit any fault. Ultimately, 
The Royal Canadian Mounted Police charged the Goler clan with approximately 137 counts of incest and abuse, and over a dozen family members went to prison. But what the public quickly discovered was that more than punishment, the Golers needed help after enduring generations of extreme poverty and social prejudice. Believe it or not, the Goler family members that had been arrested were let out on bond. Marjorie Goler stated in an interview that she was, quote, old enough to know what incest was, but still seemed slightly confused. Marjorie Goler. You know what incest means? I know what it means. I'm old enough to know. There ain't been none of that going on that I could see. And I don't know why they try to make a great big scene of it anyway. They just got a child went and told lies that they're leading it all around now to every child. But she stated that she never saw any of that going on in the family and that the 14-year-old that had escaped and contacted the police was, quote, spreading lies. The matriarch also complained to the press that the teen had been lying and that had broken up and ruined the family. Lies, of course. So during the trial, one of the children who willingly released her name later, Donna Goler, was only 11 years old when the authorities removed her from her home in the 1984 raid. Her own father, William, had forced intimate relations with her for years, and remember she was 11, and her testimony at his trial helped him get sent to prison. She said the children abused would be as young as five years old. In total, and this gets kind of graphic, so disclaimer, disclaimer, Wanda Winston, the common law wife of William Goler, was sentenced to four years for sexually assaulting eight children, four boys and four girls. William himself received seven years for gross indecency, incest, and buggery, which is apparently anal intercourse. Cranswick received six years, nine months for buggery with a 12-year-old male cousin. Josephine Goler received six months for sexual assault with her former boyfriend, Earl Johnstone, receiving six months for performing oral sex on a young boy. Mary Goler Johnstone received one year in jail for sexual assault. Mary's husband, Lawrence, received two and a half years for buggery with a niece and one year for having sex with a 12-year-old girl. Tom Goler received three years for buggery with a nephew and a niece. Stella Jr.'s former husband, Roy, received one year for buggery with a seven-year-old girl. Eugene Brown, married to one of the sisters, got two and a half years for abusing his niece and nephew. Ralph Kelly, who was married to one of the sisters, was sentenced to three years for buggery with a seven-year-old girl. Sinclair Gildry, again married to one of the sisters, received one year in jail for having sex with a 12-year-old girl. Charlie Goler Jr. received two years for having sex with a female cousin under the age of 14. And there really is a little bit more, but I think we all get the gist, right? So in 1998, over a decade later, Donna began crusading to change Canadian laws to better protect children. Her proposed changes included making it illegal for convicted pedophiles to be around anyone under the age of 14 without supervision. Her father, William, was placed on trial a second time for the same crime against a different child after his first release from prison. Donna later stated, quote, The first time I can remember I was five, just going on six, because I had just graduated from kindergarten going into grade one. I came home and that was the first time I had been raped and it was by my father. If somebody wanted to have sex with one of his kids, he would let them for a case of beer or a carton of cigarettes. Side note, she's talking about her grandfather. They got to pick out whichever child they wanted to have sex with. We had nothing to say. We couldn't prevent it. We couldn't stop them. We were basically lined up against the wall and they chose the one they wanted and we were forced to do it." End quote. 
So from what I could find, the homestead is currently abandoned or mostly abandoned. The judge feared the children would actually never recover, but they did receive excellent psychological care and they did at least have somewhat of a normal life. Five have been adopted and another five were in foster homes. The two older teenagers kind of had a lot of trouble in the foster homes, but I mean, really that's to be expected. Some say that a few of the remaining family members still live up on that mountain, but under new names. And that's really about as much of this story as I could stomach. So tell me guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below if you're watching, or you can always DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can email me at serial killing Instagram at gmail.com. I have a PO box now, so I'll leave the address to that below. And as always, thank you so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much and have a great day.